Jason Wesson first released the 686 and its predecessor, the 586, in 1980. But seeing as how I wasn't around yet in 1980, I did a little reading to learn more about the history and the origin of this model. Do you know, in 1980, a gallon of gas on average cost $1.25 per gallon of unleaded fuel. The 686 wasn't Smith & Wesson's first 357 revolver. They had K-frames, which were a little smaller, and N-frame revolvers, which were a little larger. For those of you who are a little more unfamiliar with revolvers, the N-frame is the same size frame that the Model 29 44 Magnum revolver is, which is the Dirty Harry gun. A lot of law enforcement officers developed a preference for the K-frame 357 revolvers because that 357 round was very powerful and the K-frame being smaller, thinner, lighter made it very maneuverable. But the problem was because they were thinner with extensive use of that 357 Magnum round, sometimes they would crack right around where the barrel meets the frame in this uh, forcing cone area they would occasionally develop a crack and so law enforcement personnel had a demand for a revolver that would be more maneuverable like the k-frames but more durable like the big n-frame the compromise was this l-frame the l-frame has a reinforced barrel but it also has a larger frame overall, so it's a little heavier as well as being a little thicker. In 1980, Sony released their first personal cassette player, the Walkman. I mentioned before that the 686 is kind of heavy. Well, it's a 39 ounce firearm. And with me not having a lot of upper body strength, that makes it, makes it sometimes uncomfortably heavy. When I have the the revolver out, you know, extended at my the end of my arm's reach, and I fire off a couple of shots, it ends up feeling almost like an isometric workout, having that, like, over two pound weight at the end of my reach for however long it takes me to make those shots. One of the plus sides to the fact that the Smith & Wesson is heavier, though, is that it's easier to keep steady. And I want to show you a little bit of footage of what I'm talking about. As you see here, it says it's chambered in 357 Magnum, but the 686 will also shoot 38 special rounds. I like that because being broke a lot of the time, that gives me the benefit of buying a larger volume of rounds at 38 specials and just kind of plinking away for whatever reason I feel like shooting more rounds, like the days when I want to work on trigger control. For me then, I want to put just more rounds down range. On the other hand though, the 357 Magnum round is just a lot of fun to shoot. And that's part of the novelty for me of having a 357 revolver is having that, that big muzzle flash and that big kick. In 1980, the Summer Olympics were held in Moscow, Russia. One of the things that drew me to the Smith & Wesson over the similar Ruger GP100 is this trigger pull. I like to fire in double action just for, for the challenge of it. That longer pull gives me or makes me have to focus more and keep my aim steady during that whole trigger pull and I just enjoy the challenge of it. 
and this is clear and I'll show you how long and heavy that pull is okay so maybe that was a little quick but here we go it's about a 10 to 12 pound pull there we go but in single action it feels almost feather light and it's that light and crispness of trigger that I ended up preferring a little bit over the Ruger, even though the GP100 is a little bit cheaper, a little more affordable. Isn't that pretty? In the United States, the number one song for the year of 1980 was Call Me by Blondie. The sights on the 686 are adjustable rear sights with a fixed front sight. The rear sight is a white notch and then the front sight is a red blade. The fact that they're large makes them easy to track, despite the fact that they're not a sight picture that I'm more familiar with because I shoot a lot of 1911s that have the three dot sight. But I'm gonna show you a little bit of range footage and you can see how well I do it. Part of the draw for the 686 for me was just the simple fact that it's a revolver. When I was a kid, I had a cap gun that was a revolver, and when you pulled the trigger, it revolved the cylinder, and then the hammer released, and it fired the cap, and there's a little wisp of smoke, and then the next trigger pull revolved the cylinder again. So it kind of, for me at the time, it felt like it was, you know, a, a real gun. and. I remember I played for hours with my brother with that cap gun and that ended up being kind of a, a bonding time for us. Now that we're adults we both go to the range and we shoot the real revolvers and I mean it's I'm not going to say that it's the same experience as playing with a toy as a kid but the bonding between my brother and I being that shooting is a family activity for us is something that I value and it kind of makes reminds me of that nostalgia from you know playing as a kid. In 1980 the United States had a presidential election in which Reagan won with a landslide victory over Carter, the incumbent president. The simplicity of the style of revolvers lends itself somewhat to newer shooters just because they're not a lot, there aren't a lot of controls to learn how to use. You just eject the cil release the cylinder and eject the casings and you're pretty much good to go. But the nice trigger and the sights that are easy to track, being able to shoot in 38 special or 357 magnum make it a enjoyable range experience for new shooters as well as seasoned shooters. And as it turns out, I'm not the only one who likes revolvers. Yeah. I just <laughs> I still say that's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> 